Hello and welcome to Preprints in Motion. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers and discuss their latest preprint and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. But we don't stop there. Every month we'll be bringing you special episodes with open science leaders where we discuss how to fix academia. Easy, right? So hit that subscribe button, leave a rating, or find us on Twitter at MotionPod. But for now, let's get into the show. And this week we have Hannes Meyerborn to talk about the Exorcist. Not the Exorcist, although to be honest, kind of feels like I'm saying the same thing. Okay, let's let's get started. Let let's do it. Let's do it. I mean, I'm basically down the first bottle of wine, so this is <laughs> yeah. going to start. <laughs> I think we should leave that in and start right I there. Think, actually, I think that's where we should start. We, yes, so <laughs> this episode is going to be slightly unprofessional, anyway. <laughs> I give a talk on the member trafficking thing, and they ask me the same thing. Do the fun fact, and for for them, I gave the fun fact that I went. I spent both Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve on a plane after my PhD <laughs> because I was being so done with everything that I just wanted to time out at the mm. beach. So I was going to fly to Bali and like spend a week on the beach and fly home again. And then I started my postdoc. So I think that is a fun fact that can be used. There you go, John. If you need a fun fact, there it is, if you need one. So, <laughs> so if you've just joined us on that note, Today, we're speaking with someone who we know quite well from the show. So I think everyone is aware that the three people involved in making the show are all friends. Uh, but amazingly, we have friends outside of the show. And uh, One of those is Hannes, who is just downing his millionth glass of wine now. And Hannes is a postdoc up in Dundee. And he's just posted an interesting preprint that has some really cool microscopy images associated with it. And I know I keep doing this. I keep bringing up really cool preprints that have like amazing images, and this is not the format for images, it turns out. Somebody could have told me that before we started a podcast. Uh, but m- we might we might get lucky. Hannes might share it again on, on Twitter and see if we can get some more likes and get his serotonin levels even higher than they are. Yeah, if you if you go to the Twitter account after the release of this, we'll uh, I'm sure we'll be able to get you uh, across some, some of the pretty pictures, and they are worth looking at because they are very beautiful, some of them. If you like coloured spheres. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in case you haven't been able to tell, John's going to be joining in a lot more on this one. Uh, Emma, unfortunately, isn't here but is sad to not be here and sends her yeah. commiserations. So I'm, I'm, I'm Emma. Um, you, you can't see it, but I've got a wig on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for joining us, Hannah. Better be here. That, that was nice. That, we like having you here. You don't have to like being here. Okay, so so your your preprint is all about the exorcist. And you kind of got to be careful how you pronounce that, because if you get that wrong, people are going to think you're doing a whole other completely different kind of thing. Yeah, it is a scary, scary exorcist. It's a big, <laughs> scary complex. Definitely true. So could you tell us what an exorcist is and why it's important? Yeah, definitely. Well, the, the name is a bit of a fun one because if the scientists are listening, they know that scientists also like to have fun every now and then. And if um, people from the Drosophila field are listening, then they know they have even more fun with naming things in very bizarre ways, quite often just to make fun of people who try to pronounce it. And I think similar things happened with the exorcist complex because it is very similar to with the exorcist, obviously. But the exorcist is a complex that is crucial for exocytosis. That's where the exo comes from. So this complex is an octameric complex, octa meaning eight. It is quite large and is responsible for the tethering of vesicles to the plasma membrane during many steps of cell trafficking but mainly doing polarized secretion. So we have to think about cells in different polarized states. If you have a migrating cell, for example, it will have a leading edge. And if you have an epithelial cell, it will have cell cell junctions. And if you have a neuronal synapse, it will have neuronal synapses, right? And all of these polarized structures are made up of vastly different proteins, but they all need to get there in the first place. And the protein complex that targets the vesicles containing the proteins that make up these structures to the plasma membrane is this exorcist complex. And that's what we've been working on. And we, we've already mentioned your pretty microscopy movies, but you've, you essentially end up with these images of these really pretty looking circles. It's the best way I can use of describing it. Could you explain what, what they are? So your, your model for how you study this? Yeah, definitely. So I would invite all of the viewers, obviously, to hopefully 
look at listeners, this reprint. Listeners, Hannes. Listeners, no one is viewing <laughs> me. That's good. <laughs> well, so I invite all of the listeners to definitely take a look at the preprint and take a look at my Twitter. My Twitter is Hannes my my name and there i have a big thread where you can see all of the uh, pretty circle movies in action because sadly in the preprint itself we did not upload any of the movies because we just quantified the movies so you just have stills and graphs and numbers so it doesn't look as impressive as it does if you upload a gif or a gif wherever you are from in that debate but yeah let's, let's not start that so <laughs> Basically, those pretty circle movies have been very successful for me on Twitter. And because they look stunningly beautiful, but what they are is obviously not just pretty images, but a scientific ways to measure the interaction of the exosis complex with membranes. So these circles are actually spheres and they are um, 10 micrometer large silica spheres that are coated with the lipid bilayer. Then I image them with confocal microscopy, meaning we can we, we take one section throughout those beads and therefore they look like a circle, but they're actually spheres. And these spheres are coated with a lipid bilayer, just like um, the cell is surrounded by a lipid bilayer, right? The cell membrane. And these are so-called supported lipid bilayers. And they are a very good model system to probe in the interaction of proteins with the membranes. And then by having fluorescent tags at the membranes and also at the protein, we can visualize this whole system in a dynamic manner, the microscope. And so by, you, you've not just visualized it, though. what you've done is you, you've characterized how this exorcist sort of comes together and forms. So the exorcist is made up of two big primary subunits, right? So how have you managed to do that? How have you been isolating out these different components? All right, very good. So we can go into very much detail of the biochemistry and I don't know oh, yes, what please. the listeners <laughs> <laughs> what the listeners are. I'm keen, but I don't think the listeners will be. <laughs> I do think biochemistry is fundamental to all life. You know, so I think kinetic rates, uh, biochemical interactions, specific binding, all of these are fundamental to all aspects of life, but it obviously depends what level of research people are involved in. Some people nerd out heavily about a binding curve, and some people are just like, whatever, you know, it binds, it makes it complex. You've just described you've just described me and John pretty well there. John's the <laughs> massive nerd, and I couldn't care less. <laughs> exactly. So I would put it brief. What we've done is we have all eight separate subunits of the octamere in viral backbones. So from these plasmids, we then produce baculovirus. So these are viruses that infect cells, but are not harmful for humans, for example. So from these viruses, then we infect insect cells. So insect cells we use, uh, so they are SF9 cells from like some, some stink bug or whatever, I don't know. Like John, I'm sure you know the uh, name. It's, it's, oh, it's spongy, it's Spurido, or fungi, or something. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. It's not a stink bug. It's uh, yeah. We'll we'll fact check. I can I can never pronounce it. I don't want to see it. But Spado tira fruki. You know what? SP nine so, SF nine cells. So. <laughs> so. That'll do exactly. <laughs> and we basically use them because they are proper eukaryotic cells that um, are very easy to grow. They need very little to grow them in, but they divide and they produce proteins very well. And if protein biochemists are listening, then they will probably know that you can make proteins from bacteria or from insect cells or from proper mammalian cells. You know, these are like kind of like the three steps that you can go in. It depends how complicated your protein is, what expression system you want to use. So we are using the SF9 cells. And basically, to make this not too detailed, we, or like I, it's always difficult. I don't know what, what to say, we. Uh, you, did the, you, you physically did I, it. I, we, you. exactly. That's what we're all about on this podcast, promoting the people that actually did the work, you see. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So what I did in the first month of my PhD, uh, of, my, of my postdoc, I'm sorry, not PhD anymore. Uh, in the first month of my postdoc, I've made all of these viruses of the eight exorcist subunits with various different tags. So all of the eight ones with three different tag variations. So eight times three is like what, 24. So I've made all of these different viruses. And then I started to assemble the whole octomere piece by piece. A bit like from Lego, where you 
add one brick to the next one, I started to assemble it from dimers, then to tetramers, pentamers, hexamers, heptamers, finally to octamer. So that was a decent amount of work. I've done probably two or three hundred pull downs just to really know what subunit interacts with what subunit. So we so I expressed them separately and then did pull downs to like see what comes down with what. So that was a lot of the groundwork was pretty hard grind work. If only those were pull-ups, you'd be ripped. <laughs> well, for every pull-down, I'll do a pull-up. <laughs> we do jokes, too, at PPIM. <laughs> so, yeah, but I, I think, like, all of this grind work was quite important to really set the basis of how the whole octameric complex interacts with each other. And I think a lot of listeners are probably scientists know that in every project, there's a time for just stupid grind, you know, and sometimes it just has to be done. We've all been there. So with the... I, I just would so... So obviously you pick sort of insect cells, which is kind of the, the, the middle ground, I guess. Uh, is the reason why you couldn't do it in bacteria? Is it, is, it, is it a folding issue or are they subunits glycosylated or what's kind of the, why specifically, why did it have to be eukaryotic rather than prokaryotic cells? Yeah. So a lot of this has been, we do benefit from the body of scientific knowledge. So it has been tried in the bacteria and it was unsuccessful. And like one of the reasons why the human complex has not been purified so far before um, we came along is that it is not that easy to do from, from bacteria. So it is uh, an octameric protein complex of total size about a megadalton, almost a bit less. It has a very complex folding pattern and is very foreign to bacteria. So bacteria do not have a very sophisticated membrane trafficking machinery because they're just like single cells, you know, and, and they just they don't care very much. In eukaryotes, where we have multicellular structures, it is much more important to traffic the right thing to the right place. You know, so a lot of things like GTPases and traffic factors are not that well known to bacteria. And, and therefore, they just like stick it in inclusion bodies or it aggregates, you know, they, they, they don't know what to do with it. Sorry, I was drinking at the wrong time there. I thought you were going to keep on talking. Well, I can't um, keep on talking, but I also <laughs> want to give you some space to like um, ask questions. I don't want to be like in one hour monologue of Hannes talking to the camera because that can happen easily. <laughs> Um, so bringing it back to general exorcist stuff, one of the things we've not mentioned yet, but is a big part of the preprint are pips. Yes. Uh, which are phosphoinositides. And I'm only going to say that once because right. I'm not going to get that right again. We can stick with pips. We can stick with pips. Let's stick with pips. So pips are these things that kind of give membra membranes a bit of an identity, right? So they help signpost where the cargo is going to go, if I'm understanding things right. So have you tried switching out the pips and seeing what happens to the cargo. Does the cargo within the exorcist still go to the right place? Does the exorcist not form? Or did your cargo get lost somewhere? Or does it go to the wrong place? Yeah. So the pips are very interesting. And um, I've gained a lot of appreciation for them during my postdoctoral work. And uh, you mentioned correctly, they are a signpost for membrane identity. So what they are, they are a group of phospholipids with specific head groups that are differently phosphorylated. And depending on where the endolysosomal system you are, your organelles will, will have a different identity of phosphoinositols. And through our work, we really highlight the importance of the continual interchange of the identity of membranes. As, they, as the membranes get trafficked to different places throughout the cell, they change their identity and they change their uh, phosphinositide code. So we could show that as a vesicle travels towards the plasma membrane, which has the identity of PI45P2, it gains this identity to go there. And I, and I think that is one of the things that I find quite fascinating for my own work and also for my future work is how this membrane identity is in constant flux and is being constantly changed by the um, activity of kinases and phosphatases that change these pips around. So is this impacted by sort of the cell's environment, so things that are external to the cell that it might be taking in? So for example, an immune cell when it comes activated, will upregulate its glycolysis pathway, for example. And that has a whole bunch of knock-on effects that we are only really recently starting to understand what that is to a cell. But is, is this something that can come into play on this kind of thing? And Because, I mean, presumably these enzymes are used elsewhere as well. Yes, yeah, interesting question. There is a lot of fluidity within the PIP pathways, right? And in different stimulations, will have different effects on cells. But I don't quite know. All right. 
so if we look at different stimulations, if we look at differently polarized cells, for example, then you have the phosphonositides being localized at different places. For example, if you have cells that you stimulate with uh, bacteria, they will engulf this bacteria in a process called macropinocytosis. And this will involve phosphonosotyl 3, 4, 5 phosphate, so PIP3. Yeah. And that will be generated at the place where really these bacteria or spheres, or whatever you give to them, are being taken up. And then you also have uh, different phosphonosotyls in the lysosome and different phosphonosotyls in the mitochondria. And with different stimuli, they will act differently. But it is still a bit of an area of a research about like how they act and what stimulation. So for immune cells, I think it would be quite interesting to know. Yeah, I mean... It kind of your description of how it changes reminded me of a talk I saw years ago now by um, Judy Allen, and she was talking about how in neutrophil development uh, the lipid content changes over time, and that is uh, crucial to like normal development. Mm. Um, it just kind of reminded me of that. And the other thing that sort of this has relevance for with immune cells is that immune cells, when they secrete things, it's very directional, right? It, people from the textbook seem to think immune cells just secrete things at, at random directions, but it's not. If, you know, if your immune system has a, a bacteria in front of it and it's going to secrete enzymes or proteins, what it's going to secrete out, it does that directed at, at, at the bacteria in front of it, not just out to the side somewhere useless. So, it, it, yeah, it was just interesting potential. I think, like, what is interesting me and what I've thought about doing in the future, if I ever gain independence, would be to look at the um, immunological synapse between a killer cell and a mm. target cell. That's, that's what I'm thinking of, yeah. There you have two membranes that are very close to each other. So they're like, what happens there is like the killer cell attacks the target cell and like really like latches onto it like a vampire and starts <laughs> biting it and mm. secreting it. And this zone where they form a contact is a very specialized zone. And the phosphonosotides in that zone are also very heavily re regulated. And it is still a bit unclear about how these vesicles infuse to that synapse and then release the toxic agent that kills the poor target. You should you should chat with Dan Davies at Manchester. He does he's like the big name in immune synapse stuff and does a lot of really cool imaging stuff. Uh, anyway, moving away from immunology, go on, John. Ask his question that isn't immunology. No, no, no. Well, yeah, I was going. No, I was going. I was going to say. I think this was just again with the, the whole membrane identity thing. This was something I had had such an appreciation before. Before this, like, obviously, I knew the membranes had these different identities, but yeah, just thinking about it, you know, when a when a vesicle merges into a plasma membrane, you're like, well, surely that's going to end up as a little patch of like a different membrane identity, which is then what this is kind of all about. It's about like matching it up as it goes. So maybe this is a, a nice moment to talk about ARF six, which is this uh, ah. protein. It's very important in this. Uh, this process uh, and i have a question on that in a minute but i'll let you give a little bit of background about what rf6 is first all right okay so rf6 so let's start at the beginning what are gtpases i do not think it is a trivial thing and i do not think that most people know what a gtpase is it's a fun side topic we can talk about it in, <laughs> at, at another point like my girlfriend is a non-scientist you know so whenever i talk with her i am very cautious to like back it up as far as you can so rf6 is a small gtpase Small GTPases in membrane trafficking have a switch-like behavior. They can be in an on and in an off state, depending on if they have GDP or GTP bound. So this is guanosine triphosphate or diphosphate. And these two nucleotides can be exchanged by the function of exchange factors. So this gives the cell a mechanism to specifically turn on and turn off these small GTPases, and then effector proteins will bind specifically to the on state, sometimes to the off state as well, but mainly to the on state. So it is a question about how do cells regulate spatial temporarily, like where membrane goes. And this is done through these small GTPases. And R6 is one of these small GTPases. There is a whole family of them. I think in total there are, well, it's difficult to put this on <laughs> because people will judge me if I say it wrong. There are hundreds of small GTPs small, out there. Small. Yeah, it's a very, very, it's a very complex field, you know, and it, it, there are a lot of them. And basically we could identify one of them that is specifically turned on. And when this R6 GTPs is being turned on, it recruits a lipid kinase called uh, PIP5 kinase that phosphorylates these phosphorylinositols and changes, therefore, the identity of the membrane. So this is a mechanism about how the cell can say, now we change the identity of the membrane. It switches R6 on, and this leads to a change of identity of membrane. 
So my so my follow-up question to that was going to be about because obviously R6 is kind of specific to that. Like how how does R6 come to be on one of these V scores? Is it just V scores coming from certain places, sort of have it pre-attached, you know, ones going from the, the kind of the Golgi. Are you the, asking the million dollar question? Ah, uh, is that the one we don't know? Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't know if this was known or not. But. No, like there's this big dark <laughs> horse in the field of membrane trafficking that is like how do the gtpa just go to the right place you know because obviously you always try to like find the factor before and you always try to step back you know and you always try to find out how things go to where they need to go and this is most of the time in membrane trafficking where the thing stops you know like the question how do the gtpa in the first place gain to the go to the right vehicle that is a question that is uh, a big factor in the field and there are hypotheses out there, and I think it is mainly stochastic. You know, I, I think it is a bit of random, but it's also unclear. Yeah, because, well, it, it gets very complicated. I could spend just an hour about like how the GTP does go to the membranes, but it is very complicated. Well, we, we, there's another question you can kind of speculate on then. So one of the things you show is that the, the two subcomplexes bind these coated beads stronger than the entire complex does which would kind of seem a bit counterintuitive so i mean why why is that do you, do you have any ideas why that might all happen? right yeah sure we're going into the details definitely yeah definitely we have an idea yes who wrote this question <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I, I do hope we address this in the preprint if not then um, definitely i I'm, I'm happy to um, clarify it but it does get very much into biochemistry now so Listeners, be aware. If you don't like biochemistry, maybe um, put some <laughs> fingers in your ear. <laughs> don't don't leave. Yeah, us. skip ahead, skip ahead like a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like in biochemistry, what is essential for life is binding kinetics. Yeah, and everything has an on right and everything has an off right, and everything binds to something and unbinds to something. That is the truth, and that is um, the case for every interaction in biology. The only thing that doesn't unbind is if you have a covalent interaction where something are really covalently bonded, then they will stick to each other forever. No, but otherwise, you always have an on and off right. And what we could show is that the two halves of this whole octamer complex bind to these lipids with very much the same affinity, meaning the same um, KD. KD doesn't tell anyone anything if they are not biochemists, but the KD basically is the... the same strength. Yeah, exactly. It is, it is a measure of binding affinity or strength. Like the lower the KD, the higher the affinity, the higher the strength of binding. And both halves of these complex bind to membranes with very much the same strength. But then if we put these two halves together, they bind with less affinity. And this was a big surprise for us. Because if you think about binding kinetics, we have to take into account affinity and avidity. Now, affinity is an overall measure about like how strong the binding between two things are. Avidity is now, if you have two things that bind to the same substrate, their separate affinity should add up to make the whole avidity higher. You know, so you can imagine that if you have two parts that bind to the same thing, then the separate affinity of these two parts should add up to get, give you a higher avidity. And I know this is very complicated for any listener, and I do not know if we should really talk about this in a podcast because it is pretty hard biochemistry. I, I asked this question because John said you had a good ship anchor analogy. Yes. <laughs> I've not heard no, this we yet. Do have a, we do have a ship anchor. <laughs> you went straight we've, science. We've not got to that analogy yet. It's coming. <laughs> exactly. So we don't see um, an avidity effect between these two subcomplexes to the membrane. Therefore, we argue, and we can show that, that only one of those binding interfaces binds to the membrane at once. You know, So it is situated in trans for the biochemists. You know, in, It is not in cis- where it is on the same side, but but these two binding interfaces are in trans, which are on the opposite sides. So if one side binds, the other side cannot. Because if you think about it, one side could be on the tummy, one side could be on the on the back. You know, you, you can't bind two things at the same time. Is the other side binding anything at all? Yes, definitely. Yeah, that's how it links the V-cells. Def- yeah, exactly. Definitely. So this other side is then able to bind other membranes. You know, so this is how it tethers two membranes to each other, we think. You know, that it is able to have two binding sites, but they don't bind to the same membrane. They bind to opposite membranes. And now the question is, like, why is the affinity of the whole complex lower than for its halves? That one is not easy to answer but the important point is it is not higher 
if it would be higher, so like a lower KD, then we would know that there was an avidity effect between two binding interfaces binding to the same membrane. But since it is lower, you can say that it is not the case. And then there's an analogy that I like to use to visualize it in my uh, tiny brain is if you have an anchor that is trying to anchor down a ship and you have the two half of the complexes have the same anchor, but they only have to anchor down half of the whole complex. So it's much less to anchor down. But now for the whole complex, you have to anchor down something that is twice the size. So it is like comparing anchoring down like a big sail ship to like a massive cruise ship. Because even though you have the same binding interfaces, they are only present in half of the protein or in the whole octamate complex. And I, th I think that's like how I try to make it work in my head. So if you use, if you, I think that makes sense. If you use the same pathetic teeny tiny anchor from a sailboat on a cruise ship, the cruise ship's going to just plow ahead and keep going. Exactly. And that's why we think that there's a less affinity of the whole complex to the membrane than of its separate parts, which are smaller. Yeah. Uh, so are the two parts the same size as each other, or is one part slightly bigger? Uh, pretty much 50 50. Yeah, they're pretty much. I, I think like one is uh, okay. 350, the one, other one is 400. So, yeah, they're pretty much the same size. This is, this is, this is all an ancient duplication event of um, evolution, like happens so often. Mm. So has anybody tried knocking down or out or, you know, all or some of the excess components? And if we do that, what happens? What, what I mean, presumably if you miss one of those parts of each side of that thing, you don't get your whole excess form and then, then you can't. It can't do its job, yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. So it has been done by a few people. And there's also some very exciting work coming out soon from a PI in um, Cambridge, who I don't know if I can name it on here publicly. But he has done a lot of these knockouts. And basically what has been seen in the field is if you knock down or out any of the single subunits, you get a drastic decrease in vesicles that are being tethered to the plasma membrane. So all of the eight subunits are important. If you knock down or out any one of them, you get less tethering to the plasma membrane. And for people who are interested in mice and development, I think it is incompatible with life. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that sounds like it's going to be, if, if you try it in vivo, like in, like, well, in vivo in animals, I suppose, to in cells, that that's going to be you know, embryonic lethal by the sounds of it. But Yeah, like even cells don't survive long. You know, <laughs> like even um, cells in a culture dish don't survive long if you're not caught. It really does look like I've been stabbed in the shot. <laughs> exactly. That's what I thought. Like, oh my God, <laughs> it happened. Jo Johnny's just had a new tattoo colored in today for anyone that, uh, if I leave that bit in, that's what that, that's what that was. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's in a bit of pain. He keeps wincing. <laughs> so that, that's all the questions I had about the preprint. I think we've covered it pretty well, actually. And I mean, I knew this anyway, but I'm going to say it in front of people for a change. But you are very good at explaining complex things. Yeah, it is. It, it is because I live with the non-scientists <laughs> at home. You know, <laughs> that is because why I think. I did. Uh, I, I do have to refer people back to your your original Twitter thread um, with all the images, like which has got like actual, you know, the, the sort of scientific, you know, kind of graphs and the proper figures and things. I suppose just kind of schematics, and it's but it is nicely explained, and I do recommend people to go and have a bit of a look at it. God, we're plugging your Twitter account so much. Yeah. Although to be honest, you've probably got more followers than our Twitter account. I, I, I do. I so do. So some of it's, Hannes's followers would like to come over to yeah, us. It's a pretty circle. We, we'd greatly appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty circle. Uh, Twitter is um, a fickle beast, isn't it? You know, like it's very difficult to like to like play the Twitter game. It's not easy. The, like you have to have the right amount between like pretty images and science and mm. non-science. And I don't know. It's very difficult. I don't really understand. Yeah, you can't just do what I do and vent. No, you shouldn't. What's sound really interesting is that um, I know all of the all of the guests we have on seem to follow Emma and John on Twitter after the shows. None of them follow me. Mm. Some of them do now. But th th for quite a while, there was this habit where they would all follow John and Emma and not me, as if they hadn't just spent an hour talking to me. Oh that was enough. <laughs> Maybe they checked your Twitter account and were like, mm -hmm, no. <laughs> I know, I'll probably do. Where do I find out about the different bioarchived licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Hey, that Bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint servers, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic. 
plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Surely they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows. So one of the things we, we like to do on the show, I'm not sure if Hannes listens or not. I, I assume you've listened to Don't some. Don't pull that thread. Don't, Don't pull that, that thread. Question. Don't pull that thread. <laughs> <laughs> I do sometimes. So one yeah. of the things we like to do is talk about the not, not just the preprint itself, but the process of preprinting, publishing fields, and just your experience in academia. So that's this section of the show, now that we're back from our little break. So we have the benefit of knowing you, so we, we kind of know some of these answers anyway. But you're in, I think compared to the other people we've had on, your journey towards why this has been preprinted is slightly different, I think, so far, mm. if I'm remembering correctly. So wh- wh- where did the decision to preprint this work come from? So for me, it was very important to get this preprinted so I can apply for my own independent fellowships. So I made the point quite early on with my supervisor that... It is important to have something out there yeah. for everyone who's a scientist listening who knows if you put on your CV, submit it to nature, well, everyone will laugh at you, right? Because you can submit everything to nature. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean jack. Yeah. But if you put on your CV, this paper, a link to bioarchive that is usable. So then the funders or the agencies or whoever you apply to, whoever you send your CV to, they can actually click this link open it up and see what you've done. And this was very crucial for me. So because there are a lot of funding agencies and funding schemes out there, and a lot of them are very much focused on early career research. And it can take quite a long time to get things genuinely published in like a real journal. So to put out a preprint gives us early stage career researchers the chance to show that we have done our work and then apply to fellowships or grants with this on our CV because it can take at least half a year from submitting something to actually publishing it, you know? So it is a long and strenuous journey. And half a year is a lot of time when we are talking about grant submissions and fellowship submissions, and it is quite important for that. Half a year is one application cycle. So if you're waiting on your paper to come out, you've missed your first chance. So this, you haven't just preprinted this immediately though. So you did send this around journals first. And I think one of the things that has been an issue is that this work straddles two different fields. And so it is a bit difficult. I think whenever work does that, it's always difficult to find the right home for it because non-specialist journals don't want it because it's not non-specialized enough. Specialized journals don't want it because it's not specialized enough and, and you can't you can't really win. So how, how's that process been? Yeah, so this whole process... Other than horrifically <laughs> stressful. This whole process is still ongoing. So there is not an end point towards this yet. And we can ask ourselves why, and that is a very big field of debate. So why do people have such a hard time publishing things? Even though we have gotten a tremendous good feedback, it's always, for me, very puzzling. You present this work on like conferences to people in the field who know their stuff, you know, who really do know their, their onions. And you, and you get like good feedback. Everyone is like, oh, yeah, that's great. I'm sure it's going to be fine. You know, and then you submit it to a journal and the editor says like, nah, <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know. Like, where does it come from? You know, like, we're like I don't know. Like, do editors have too much power that they can just say, I don't like it? You know, it's like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, and they don't even need to give you a reason. They can, they can just say like, nah, nope. <laughs> you know, like, you're done. I don't know. It seems like we're in this strange situation where a lot of like journal editors are sort of full-time journal members of staff. And so they, they haven't done science themselves for many years, whereas the reviewers are actually usually active scientists. So it's this sort of strange thing of people who are actually kind of out of the field, having that initial gatekeeping opportunity on something they yeah, haven't generally and, done and, and you can't even time. argue with them that's the no. worst part like you you send it to the editors and they say nope and you just have to like say all right you know we go on 
like when you get reviews and they say we don't like your work you can at least argue back and say you know we have done this we've done this i don't think i think you're wrong because of this reason and that reason and this reason but the editors they can just say no and you're done you're out you know and they don't even have to say why i mean we often bang on about uh the public peer review about how you know kind of the, the peer reviewing kind of comments from paper should probably be you know kind of attached to and and published alongside the paper um and they're not always and this and especially that kind of decision would be very useful to have as well so does having a preprint out make you feel better about that whole process because like you said you've had a lot of good feedback people have you were you were talking you were throwing numbers at us before we started the show properly so maybe you want to do that again but you 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 know the paper has had a lot of attention so you know it's clearly something people in the field are enjoying yes i think that putting up a preprint can empower the scientist and the individual in a way that without it is very difficult so from this preprint, just in the first two or three weeks, we've had like 500 downloads, thousands of clicks and things. And it does make a difference towards me feeling appreciated, you know, and like me feeling that my work is actually being read and being seen. Because we've also submitted our work to three journals so far, where it has all been desk rejected. You know? And that would make you feel like, oh my God, my work is rubbish. Having this dichromity between the actual readership, the public, and the editors points out to me that there is a there is something different. You know, there there's something going on where the actual scientific community really likes the paper and actually thinks it is pretty fire, while the editors are like, nope, <laughs> you know, don't care about it. And I don't quite know where that comes from. But of course, now that you've done that. When you next send it to a journal in the cover letter, you can say, well, we've had this many downloads, this many people have read the thing. And then you can show that actually the community are interested and maybe that might sway editors. I've, I've, I've done, I do that with my past few papers. I don't know if it made any difference or not, but I know other people who also do that. And, you know, it, they say it, it does help to get past that initial hurdle. Maybe if an editor is not familiar with that stuff, it makes them maybe think twice. I mean, I, I think at the basis of this all is a very complex system with no easy answers you know we, yeah. we get that answer a lot <laughs> <laughs> you know it is a simple truth that there are way more papers being put out than can be put in any journal you know so there does need to be a triage somewhere where someone at some point has the power to decide what is hot or not and that will always lead to hurt feelings and that is just a point about our scientific system that we're in you know that there is well if we think about capitalism there's a demand and supply right and our world is built on a capitalistic basis as much as i disagree with it about Mm. too much um too much supply of papers to too little demand of um journals Mm. editors you know so there's a power imbalance where the journal editors can very much sit in their uh, big chair and say like nope Yes, nope, you know, so they're like Caesar being like giving the thumbs up and the thumbs down yeah. about like and their some, throne of skulls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is curation process, I suppose, is the word we're looking for. That that was one of my questions. Well, no, it, curation, I think it's more than that, you know, and I want to be honest with everyone listening, you know, I do think there is a case for high impact journals and low impact journals and the triage of it because I know and every scientist does know how much there is published every year and how much one can actually read. When we published our work and I looked at the alt metrics, you know, like whatever that is good for, we were at like the top 5% quantile, you know, um, out of 20 million <laughs> research outputs, we were a place 100,000, 117 or whatever, you know, the number. But that just makes you think like the 20 million research outputs tracked in the same time. It's like, good Lord, like who's, who can like read 20 million research outputs? You know, and, and like, how do you sift through all of this research in a way that makes it visible to people? Because that is my main point. It's like, I've spent these last three years busting my ass off, working really hard. And I do not want my work just to be lost in the cloud of um, 20 million papers. A dusty cupboard. <laughs> so, so, I mean, this is something we occasionally talk about and get into. Um, we'll, we'll not do it here. Um, but, you know, you say there's a place for high impact and low impact, which, okay, we'll take that. That's fine. But 
what do you mean by that? Are you meaning high impact as they currently are, which is very general? Or are you meaning that we need a definition within the fields? Because, you know, we've got all this science being published and a lot of it is a bit pointless. And I think the question is not where it's published or how it's published. It's more the basis of what we're actually asking and doing. I think we need to go right back to the start of the whole thing to really sort that problem out. But is is this is are you arguing for general journals or arguing for specialized journals? Because there, I think there is a difference. Yes, definitely. So I think I, for myself, differentiate very much between what is in my field and what is not in my field. I will read everything that's published, wherever it is being published, that has to do with what I am working on. I have a PubMed alert. I uh, I look through BioArchive with my hit words, just like the Exorcist and Clathrin. That's what I used to work on. And I will read it, yeah, no matter what the journal is. You know? And I will read at least the abstract to get an idea of it if I think it's interesting. And I don't care where. So that's that, you know. And then there is all of the research that goes on outside of my field that can be very impactful, but I would never be aware of if it would not be published in this journal that gives it visibility to me from outside of the field. So these are two very different things that uh, need to be distinguished, right? So I would never look at journals that are very out of my field and then, you know, like, but if something is being published in Cell, Nature or Science that I never had to do with, but it's like really a great, profound finding and I go on these um, websites every now and then and, and I see it and I think like, oh, wow, that, that's really great. That's really cool. You know, that's what they're for. And that's, I think, fine. I don't mind that. I think it's, it's what they should be for. I think at the moment, a lot of what goes on in there is just, have you done some single cell sequencing? Oh, yes, great. We'll publish you. Have you got the words phase separation in there? <laughs> that, yeah, exactly. That's, I mean, that's coming from an immunology perspective. Anything immunology at the moment that is single cell sequencing and maybe one other hot topic, hot technique kind of goes in those. And it's not the most cutting edge science, a lot of it from, you know, I can say that. But I mean, if you were coming new from the field and you didn't know that, you would assume this is all amazing science. Mm. And it honestly isn't. Yeah. So I understand your point. You're definitely right. There are a lot of problems with it, you know, and uh, mm. it is not... How it is right now is not how it should be. But no. I think in general, there is a point in my mind to have like selected journals that are really there for like the high impact science that everyone should read, no matter what field you're in. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't completely disagree with that. The problem, of course, comes is that the people who get into those journals will still use them the way they do now, which is, well, my work must be better than everyone else's work. And therefore, I deserve that professorship and to bully and abuse my staff however I like as some of them have been doing. How, how do you obviously, get around that? Obviously, no one is arguing for bullying and abuse. And like, obviously, no one will think that. But we are also in a reality where we have a capitalistic system where there is a lot more supply than demand. You know, So how do you sit on a panel and select if there are 50 people out there who are all good scientists and all want the same position? How do you select the one for the grant position, right? And that is the question that we need to ask ourselves. See, and my argument would always be that you should look beyond the science and you should look at what they do to make academia better, what they do for outreach or teaching activities. You know, like my job is science. I want to be judged as a scientist. I don't want to be judged for things that I do outside of my job, you know? You don't judge me if I help an old lady across the street. No, no. Okay, yeah, but your job as a postdoc is to do science, but your job as a PI is not just to do science, it's to teach, maybe, or it's to mentor students, or it's to do outreach and educate the public. Educating the public, I think, is a fundamental job of being a scientist, whatever level you're at. Because if we don't tell people what we've done, is there any point to doing it, really? Well, I would argue against that. I think that there's a very different skill set to being a good um, public outreach person than to being a good scientist. And I think there's I a big fault within the hiring process where um, scientists are being hired on the basic of like high publications and like high scientific merit, but they actually are not good teachers. They're not public outreachers, but yet we all expect them to do it. Like, so we expect someone yeah. to be able to do everything only because they can publish good and do good science. So what we should do is we should separate this from each other. We should have dedicated outreach office that actually does outreach. We should have dedicated teaching people that actually love and want to do teaching. We should have dedicated scientists who love and do science. But like to expect all of it from one person is just stupid. It is, it is. and I, I fully agree. But then at the same time, then you've got a situation where what if somebody likes doing research, but because they've spent time 
Or maybe it's not even choice. Right. A lot of this comes down to the fact that often it's women who do these kind of extra things, right? And they get the higher workload. And we're not including childcare stuff and anything outside of work. We're just including things that do work. So they sit on more panels. They teach more. They do more of the general stuff that nobody ever really accounts for but is essential to a department running well. What if they want to be someone who primarily does research? They can't compete with those other people because their time is being taken away from the research time. And it's not always a choice. Not everyone can say no to the big boss who ta- says, you're going to do this for me. Or, you know, even will you do this for me? It's not always a question. Sometimes it's a, you're doing it. I'm just going to pretend to ask nicely. So, I mean, that, that's where I'm getting at with we should account for other things. But maybe maybe we do need, I think we need to rethink the, the hiring process is my point. And it shouldn't just be you do really good science that comes in all these high impact papers. I agree. I agree. I think we need to rethink what the universities really want. Do they want to hire a good scientist? Do they want to hire a good teacher? Do they want to hire a good PR person? These are three different things. And I think it is unrealistic to expect one single person to be excellent in all of it. So why don't you just split it apart, do three different jobs for three different people? Uh, That would be my suggestion. I mean, so certainly from the UK perspective, some universities are now kind of doing that. So we have um, teaching fellows, for example, who's the whole point is you're independent, but you, you teach. And that is your career track. It's the same track as a the traditional sort of research track, but you're just teaching instead of doing research. So there, there are, yeah. I guess, attempts. And for me on a personal level, I find it immensely stressful to have this obligation of public outreach and all these things pushed onto me because I need it now to get my grants, mm. to get my PI, to get my independence. It is something that is enforced onto me, even though it is not what I am good at. It is not what I really want. I'm a good scientist. I want to do science and I want to get funded for my science. You know, And I know there are a lot of people who are very good at public outreach, who love doing it. And why does it need to be me? Why do I need to be able to do everything? You know, like I want to really do good science to help push forward, you know, the scientific community. But I don't really want to do all these outreach things. Like, sorry, you know, like I'm honest about it. It's not really what makes me happy. I don't think there's anyone who would disagree with you that we get pushed on to do like what the classic trope is. uh, An academic is doing like the full time work of seven to 12 other people's jobs right it's no no academic is out there just doing one full-time job they're all doing multiple jobs that they shouldn't be doing and I, I, there are very very few people if anyone who can confidently say they can do all those jobs well because it's not possible and the skill sets are so different you're very right and even in my phd it was forced onto us to have like one outreach yearly done you know so you would go to some science fair to like some things and that's fine i think these are very very important and crucial things for science and public outreach they're very important to do but i don't think you can force it onto the people who are actually not wanting to do it you know one of the other things we can talk about is being a a postdoc being the first person really in a a new lab so this is something you've just done as your postdoc it's something i seem to keep doing for some bizarre reason so i mean how have you found that experience because you've come you came from a phd in a lab with someone who I mean, there wasn't a lot of people in the lab, but it was a very established lab to one where essentially you're helping set the lab up from scratch. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a good question. And I think it's a good thing to discuss for everyone out there who is on the verge of going from PhD to postdoc. It's a very difficult decision. And there are a lot of things to consider. And for me, I did my PhD, as you said, in the lab of an old established professor who was wonderful and I love very much. And I had a good time. And at the end, I was fortunate to have published a paper in a very decent journal even before going out to looking for uh, post positions. So that, that, that put me in a very comfortable place to look for things. And I had many, well, we can do the long story, which is this. <laughs> so the long story is, <laughs> even during my uh, PhD, I was always very keen on about like what do I want to do in my postdoc and things. And I reached out very early on, um, long before I, I finished, to um, a guy in the NIH in Washington. And I said like, hey, you know, you're doing pretty cool science and I think we could do something really cool together. Here's my paper. Why don't we like have a chat and just like talk about it? And like he came back to me and we met on the phone at that time because that was before Zoom was a thing. 
So we had like a, a long phone call and like we discussed everything we wanted to do. And then he said like, hey, yeah, why don't you come over to uh, Washington? I invite you to come over and like we meet, and give a talk and we find out what's happening. So I flew over to Washington, D.C., obviously long flight, and gave my presentation, gave my science, met everyone and like all nice and good and very exciting. And it was very exciting. I was really, really thrilled and I was really shocked. And I was really like wanting to do it. And I said, like, yeah, let's, let's do it. I would really like to do the, do the postdoc with you. And he's like, like, yeah, sure. And we didn't need to think about it. You know, you go home and I will let you know what's happening. But it's very positive. You know, I think everyone really liked you and it's going to be fine. And so I was like, yes, it's going to be fine. You know, I'm going to Washington. Like, yes, ace. And then he was like, yeah, I'm just attending this conference. I'm going to let you know what's happening afterwards. Just going to need to, to speak to a few people. And then like a few weeks later, he was like, nope. <laughs> he said like, no, I'm sorry. Uh, it didn't work out for some bullshit reason you know sorry for saying it like that but like honestly for some bullshit reason that was not even genuine so everything fell through so then i was at the point where i had to decide what do i do now <laughs> so I, I just went on um, jobs at c.uk and looked at like whatever postdoc positions were out there you know yeah, so i had this whole big plan about like what i want to do with like for my postdoc and like you know i was banking everything on it and it just all fell through so I had to look what else is out there and I had to pull on my other personal resources. And then in the end, I had the decision between going to like a very big lab of like a PI that is publishing in Cell Nature Science all the time, you know, with like 20 postdocs and like big money and all these things. And I thought like, you know, if all of these postdocs and if all of these people are working and you get like maybe one big paper out a year, you know, if you do the math, that means like that most of the postdocs don't get anything published, you know, that, that, that most of these people are just, you know, forgotten. Yeah, just kind of middle authors. They'll be everything. middle authors, right? Yeah, you're not getting that one first author you really yeah. need out. So then I also interviewed with uh, my PI now, and he was a new PI, um, well, still is a new PI, on a welcome ship fellowship, Henry Dale, just setting up his lab. And he was still very much needing to succeed right so you have now two big questions to ask yourself do you want to go to like a, a big shot pi a big shot professor who has everything he needs who's like fine he'll publish whenever he publishes or do you want to go to like someone who's hungry and like needs to push and needs to succeed and wants you to get there and that's what I, and that's so that's what i did you know so i decided to go with the new pi because i knew that just him and me I would get proper training for in the first part. And his success is dependent on my success, right? So we are in interdependent on each other. So therefore, he will make sure that he really wants me to succeed. That can lead to big problems or big success, you know, because the pressure is definitely there, you know, because you need to succeed in order for the lab to succeed. If you don't succeed, the lab won't succeed and it's going to be a disaster, you know. But if you do succeed, it's going to be even the sweeter, because you are really a good team, you know, and that what happened to us, we really went and we're a good team. Like we came along very well. We had the same ideas, the same vision for like where we wanted to take the project. And we really did do it together as a team. And in that regard, I got lucky, I think, because it can also be. Disaster. Well, I could, I could tell you the other side of, of joining a new lab where it doesn't go so well, which we've never done on this yet. Not, not properly. <laughs> I don't know if I would leave it in. I think Emma might cut yeah, it out. I think Emma would suggest cutting it out. Uh, would, you'd probably suggest cutting it out in the cold light of day. Well, it, it's fair to say that you had bad past experiences. There's nothing wrong with that. But yeah, I mean, that is, you know, that the, there are, that's probably a really good story of how to make that decision, actually. There are a lot of benefits to joining a big lab in that everything's set up so you can kind of just get started. The other big benefit that you didn't mention here is that when you, I, I mean, science, there's the expectation generally that you move and generally when you move you're moving somewhere you don't know anyone if you join a big lab you've kind of got a community sometimes not always but ready made for you because there's a lot of people you can go out and talk to and do social stuff with if the lab's social the downside of joining a lab on your own is that you're on your own and you've got to hope that either the pi has has managed to, to sort of integrate with some other maybe some other new groups or just another big group there so that you've got that ready for you there with other groups or you've got to do it yourself and i think that is a that's something that people don't think about but should think about yeah you're right it's one of the things i found the hardest each move yeah right it was a bit of a pity when i started in the lab and there was no one there but my pi it was just the two of us hmm. and then you have to reach out to other labs or to um 
Oh, dare I say it, Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> and how is Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can you can spend a lot of your time not just socially alone, but at work you can spend a lot of time alone. Like a lot of my work is microscopy based. So mm -hmm. I'm in the microscope room all day long on my own. I can genuinely go to work for a week and not talk to a single person mm. at work or not at work. Uh, so there are, I mean, if you're on the microscope, you can do that anyway. But, you know, until we moved back to the main office relatively recently, that was that was my week, pretty much. There are difficulties. Yeah, I agree. And it is more difficult once you get to the postdoc stage. I, I mean, for the listeners, I've done my PhD with both um, Johnny and John and Emma. Yeah, so... It was a time where we are really all in the same place in the same circumstance, facing the same challenges. And that is something that ties one together in a way that is um, a very strong connection. And as a postdoc... Well, we're still here. Exactly. We're still here many years later. <laughs> and as a postdoc, uh, this connection is missing. You know, because you are not in the same boat as the PhD students. You are not in the same situation as them. You don't have to get your PhD. You have a different challenge ahead. You have to get paper. You have to get this done. I found it very difficult to realize that we are not on the same eye level, you know, it's, and it still hurts yeah, me a bit because in my heart, we are still very much the same, but like, not really, you know, and like, it, it does hurt me a bit <laughs> when like the PhDs are now like going out, you know, like going, going to the pub and they don't mm -hmm. ask me out anymore. Right? Yeah. I think, I think PhDs are kind of, you've got a common goal. All you're, all you're trying to do is get your PhD. Whereas postdocs are, it's a lot more complex than that because we don't start together, but we also, we're kind of in competition with each other now. So when you work with people, you work with them, but also there are unfortunately a lot of postdocs who will do whatever they can to get themselves ahead and don't want to work with anyone else. You know, they'll, they, they will make the most of the opportunities presented to them, but they won't present opportunities to other people. They won't help other people particularly. And I think anyone listening will have a, at least a few examples of people they know who are like that because it is unfortunately common. Again, lots of very nice people who will help everyone. Um, but, you know, I think postdocs are in a much more volatile position. And then you've got the added uh, difficulty of the pressure to get a paper out. And so you have then, then you've got those postdocs who never leave the lab. So they might be the loveliest people ever, but you're never going to socialize because there is still in the lab at like nine o'clock on a Friday night. And I mean, they shouldn't yeah. be. But... And postdoc is a very broad term because you also get very different postdocs who are very much established people in their own right who have a family yeah. who have a very big life outside of the lab who are mainly more middle-aged more accomplished and say you know it is my nine-to-five job i go home you know i have i and i i have my family right but that is where i saw the biggest problem i'm neither of them when i started right yeah. i don't have my set family to go home to yet i do not have the phd student friends to drink with after work mm -hmm. so then i'm alone yeah, you know, so that was a big realization for me to, you know, to come into my first postdoc to like see where is my, what is my life and my point as postdoc was was quite hard. But then, for for everyone listening who cares, I found a wonderful girlfriend and we are now very happy <laughs> yeah. into the countryside and um, it is all good. Who, who I should say <laughs> has been plugged at least three or four times so far tonight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to add her in like some mm. acknowledgement at the end now. <laughs> to Lisa, who deals with Hannah's yeah. on all our behalves, um, <laughs> and, and you'll always and you'll that, always that, have us as well. Oh yes, yeah. that I think that that has been that that that's been the thing I've struggled with the most being a postdoc is the that weird isolation and you're you're in this weird in between place where you don't quite belong anywhere and it's difficult. Anyway, uh, that wasn't a positive note to end on. <laughs> I was going to say I, I had a, we had a nice I, I had a nice little positive sum up there and then you then you brought it down. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> all right i think we'll leave all this in i think it's just you know it's uh this is this is what it's like behind the scenes folks <laughs> it's a mess <laughs> please stay tuned after the outro for information on a special event for eu and uk postdocs wanting to set the thumbs up for independent pis unfortunately for us but happily for you it's contained within part of the bloopers section so please don't judge us too much for that okay and that is the show if you enjoyed listening, then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsandmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week. Go to the toilet.
Well, in the meantime, listeners, I have to keep you all entertained. As the two old men leave us to go to the toilet to relieve their full bladders, um, I'm not really sure what to talk about. I could just insult them both, but that, that seems a little bit mean. Have I got anything to plug? No, I've got nothing to plug either. Oh, I do have something to plug. Hey, here we go. It's always weird talking to yourself. It's um, I appreciate actors a lot more these days. So, uh, a lot of people probably don't know this, but one of the many things that I've done when I'm not in the lab, which if you know me would sound like I'm not in the lab very often, but I actually am a lot. Uh, but one thing I've done is a few years ago, I set up the UK and EU postdoc Slack group. And this is a group for any postdoc, well, any PhD student about to be a postdoc or anybody about to become a postdoc from other routes who are moving to the UK or the EU who are wanting to, to just be a postdoc and see what life's like and network with other postdocs. So as part of that, on the 15th of December, we've got a Pathways to Independence workshop, which is going to, in the morning, that will have a bunch of different PIs who've used different routes to get into their independence. And they'll, they're going to give a sort of 15, 20 minute talk on what it is they did. So their, their sort of career path from PhD to independence and any tips they've got to offer on their particular pathway. And then after they've done that, there's going to be an hour long Q&A session. Uh, it's being run through the, the Slack group, uh, but also with UKRI and their uh, Early Career Researcher Forum. Uh, so that I'll put, I'll, we'll have a link to that, I guess, in the show notes. There you go. I filled the time by plugging my own shit. <laughs> oh, leaving that in then. Uh, okay. So John, you are going to have to oh. listen to that and move I it to the to end all, or the start. Unlike some of us, uh, I actually <laughs> listen to all of this. Uh, <laughs> so everyone is now back from their toilet break. This would be a really good time for the uh, ASAP Bio ad to go in, I guess. We can all announce we're about to go pee, or the old men are about to announce <laughs> they're going to go cut pee, that and then we can do I can an cut advert. That bit out. We'll do the advert, and then we'll come back <laughs> seamlessly. This is us coming back seamlessly after okay. the advert. Okay. <laughs>